Let's go. Welcome back. Last time we were here, we talked about dealing in the drug war. We started on dealing in the drug war. And this time we're gonna finish that up. Um, this might not end up being a full lecture today. It might only take part of the time, but also it's me. So what does that mean? I don't know. It might mean that we end up going over. Last time we started touching on Colombian cartels. And this is a really major part of this story is Colombia. Colombia is a prime example that is currently unfolding, a prime example of how the war on drugs has deeply influenced the politics and the social structures of various countries around the world. So cocaine, I'm sure of you might be familiar with the fact that cocaine is notorious as being an extremely bloody substance. And I mean that kind of literally because it does give you microscopic cuts on the inside of your nose, which is why sharing straws can give you hep C. And if you're super, super unlucky, and this is an astronomically low likelihood of this happening, but you could technically get HIV from sharing um, dollar bills. It's not very likely, but it is theoretically possible. So cocaine and the cocaine trade are gonna be something that we hone in on for now at this moment in time as an exemplary way that the drug trade has been influenced by the war on drugs. So last time we started talking about um, Colombian cartels and cartels in general and the massive amounts of importing that were taking place and how much cocaine Colombia was responsible for bringing in. And we're gonna immediately kick this off with Vice because Vice is the best. So something that's been happening in Colombia since the 60s is there's been a civil war basically going on that I actually don't know the current status of as of 2018 to present. I think that things are cooling off a little bit. Um, I need to be more updated on that. But up until 2017 or 2018, there's been an ongoing conflict between right-wing paramilitants and left-wing guerrilla soldiers who were at odds trying to kind of like sway the governmental positions, basically. It was a political war between right-wing and left-wing paramilitants and guerrilla soldiers. The paramilitants are called FARC, F-A-R-C, and they uh, initially, the, the left-wing guerrillas, who are vastly outnumbered, they're a very small group, were fighting for the, um, the rights of the people and protecting civilians. But over time, the lines got blurred. And what ended up happening was that the left-wing guerrilla soldiers started using similar tactics as the right-wing paramilitants to control civilian territory. And one of the major things that left-wing groups um, did was plant landmines, which is what we're about to see right now. Now you might be saying, Rachel, why are we talking about land wines and the government of Colombia? Because this is a class about drugs to which I say that's exactly the thing is that the paramilitants control the cocaine trade. And that's a thing that we see all the time again is if a country has a surplus of a particularly valuable resource or has access to a particularly valuable resource, then that means that that resource can be exploited for monetary gain, which can fund the activities of government insurgencies. So Coke is a very good example of how this can take place. It's loud, sorry. When you think of landmines, countries like Afghanistan, Sudan, Iraq, and other conflict areas around the world might come to mind. But Colombia is one of the most effective countries in the world, too. Because for the last 50 years, there's been a roiling conflict between leftist Marxist guerrillas and the Colombian government. And even though there are peace talks happening right now in Havana, the legacy of decades of war are literally sown into the soil. So we came to Colombia to find out how this nation is dealing with this ongoing, violent, and brutal problem. Since 1990, there have been over 10,000 landmine victims in Colombia, the second most in the world behind Afghanistan. Many victims are poor farmers and ranchers who live in regions controlled by the guerrilla or other narco-trafficking groups that operate in the country. But the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, has been the government's main enemy. And even after over $5 billion in U.S. military aid, around 7,000 FARC soldiers are holding off over 300,000 Colombian troops by surrounding themselves with landmines, their strongest line of defense. FARC has been around for five decades, and what began as a Marxist people's army fighting against capitalist imperialism has devolved into a guerrilla force that threatens the very people it originally sought to protect because of the thousands of landmines they've buried in civilian areas. 
eh, que forma las FARC en los campos colombianos, colocando minas al lado de las escuelas, al lado de las trochas, al lado de los caminos por donde pasa la población civil. Los bandidos han encontrado eh, en las minas eh, un asesino enterrado, un asesino muerto, que queda por siempre hasta que algún hombre de las fuerzas militares o de la población civil lo active. Over the last six months, FARC leaders have been negotiating peace with Colombia's government. But even as they talk about ending hostilities, there's no ceasefire in place. These negotiations could yield a transformative moment in Colombian history. The government is even trying to rebrand the country as a vacation. So here's the thing. As of 2001, about 40% of Colombia's cocaine was handled by the paramilitants. That's a huge percentage. At the same time, those same paramilitants were committing approximately 80% of the murders in the country. So this was a turf war over cocaine production and smuggling and distribution. That's what that, oh my God, every time, I'm sorry. I really, I don't know how many lectures it's gonna take for me to just like quit my apps. <laughs> just like not even try with do not disturb. So um, since 1958, there have been 200,000 deaths from military violence in Colombia, approximately 45,000 of which were kids and 177,000 of which were civilians. Two, mil two million children have been displaced from their homes in Colombia, and it is the second largest displaced population in the world. So this is like really bleeding in. This is not an isolated situation. It's not just that we have this civil war conflict happening here. It's that the conflict partially comes from territorial disputes controlling the land and the people who work the land, who produce this extremely lucrative good. Unfortunately, what this ends up being is a situation where it's not just the producers that get caught in the crossfire. Mind blast. You'll also, this is gonna be kind of a graphic lecture at points, just so you guys know. Likely suffer lasting effects of the injury. Yo me encontré una pila. Mauricio me dijo, ay, tiremoslos al río. Yo le dije, no, es algo mejor que esto ahí. Y Mauricio cogió una piedra y la tiró. O sea, cuando miré, miré una humarada, arena y hojas que se levantaron. Todo cambió porque si no, ya es mi hija, ya. Me montaron el potrillo y duré media hora para arriba en el potrillo. Y tuvimos tres horas en, en moto y, y en San José. Entonces, esto es terrible. Tengo, digámoslo así, tripas plásticas, eh, el intestino como que me falta y, y el hígado me falta también. So, civilian casualties, right? Now we have left-wing Marxist groups and of course Marxism Everybody loved Marxism during the 80s. Like what was more popular in the world? It's not like the United States CIA decided to work with cartel, or basically not cartels, but heroin manufacturers in France to like allow the import of heroin in exchange for shutting down communism in France. Like, wow, we really like loved communism. So the United States has just been funneling money into Colombia fighting the wrong issues. We have been pouring our monetary support not into infrastructure or economic support for impoverished individuals or anything like that. Not giving money to the people on the ground that know best how to use it for their communities, but instead funding these ridiculous military operations. Now, the same time as this happening with the left-wing um, Marxists and the right-wing paramilitants, at the same time, we have cartels in Colombia. Like these three forces are all operating simultaneously. It's a deeply militarized situation where land is just the most valuable thing and what grows on the land and the people that, again, work the land. So the Medellin cartel was a, a major player at this time. This was Pablo Escobar's cartel. 
And uh, this, this cartel made approximately $60 million a day, a lot of the time, per day, okay? And these guys were responsible for importing about 80% of our cocaine. In fact, there was one point where it was implicated that they participated in storming the Colombian Supreme Court and holding judges hostage, but this is kind of like an iffy, iffy situation here. Now, this is a History Channel video that I think is really funny because of their like weird wigs that they put on the people about two years after Rich this other kind of thing that was happening during this time period of the 70s to the 80s. Because remember, cocaine was out of style because it was associated with black laborers in the early 1900s. That's why it vanished largely, was because it became so heavily stigmatized because it was convenient to do so for racial purposes. Now, from then, it kind of just like goes out of fashion for a bit. And it's not until this economic downturn in Bolivia happens, all of a sudden there's more coca crops, and then there's just like a lot to go around and the cartels start finding ways, or at this point, it wasn't even the cartels yet necessarily. It was the beginning of that um, to import this product into America. That changes everything. the war on drugs. Drug use is on the rise. Nixon had been obsessed with marijuana and heroin. Nobody talked that much about cocaine. And within a very short period of time, it became one of the biggest money makers in drug smuggling in the world. And it caught everyone by surprise. The story of how cocaine took America by storm starts here in a Connecticut federal prison where this man's doing time for car theft. Carlos later. I just have to make it super clear that I think that the History Channel videos like this are really funny. And if you hear me laughing, it's because I cannot help myself. Car thief in the beginning. He was crazy in many ways, but also he was a visionary. At a fairly young age, he went to jail in Danbury in Connecticut. And that might have been the end of his criminal career, but it wasn't. He was given a cellmate with whom he would go on to change the drug world. Later, cellmate is a hippie misfit who specializes in smuggling marijuana from Mexico into the U.S. on small planes. George Jung. These relatively unknown criminals hooked up together and became partners. It was this match made in heaven because Jung had experience with airplanes and with smuggling marijuana and later had experience with cocaine. The combination of these two guys resulted in the conclusion to revolutionize the cocaine trade in the United States. What if I told you I could get us enough coke to get the whole world high? You ever heard of a place called Medellin? Medellin is the center of Colombia's burgeoning cocaine underworld and the home of the man with whom Carlos Later and George Jung will revolutionize the cocaine trade. Pablo Escobar Gaviria. Escobar's job was to help manage the smuggling of the cocaine product into North America. Carlos Later is about to make one of the most audacious moves in the history of the war on drugs. Jung's convinced him that small planes hold the key to their takeover of the American cocaine market. The round trip flight from Colombia to Florida is too far for a small aircraft to make without refueling. So Later finds a small Bahamian island with a long runway. It's called Norman's Key. And Norman's key was a stroke of genius because nobody was watching planes laden with cocaine flying from Colombia into Norman's key. Later's bringing in $20 million a month. Planes land and take off around the clock. Carlos Later's now head of logistics for Pablo Escobar. Carlos Later went on to really pioneer the explosion in cocaine traffic in the U.S. The man who figured out the best smuggling routes into the United States. It's all about logistics. It's all about moving the product from one place to another. Anybody who can figure out how to get it there, that's what it really comes down to. Please mute yourself. Please mute yourself if you're not muted. Already. Or I will have to find you. I found you. Do you list. <laughs> but like, don't sweat it, you know? <laughs> okay. Oops, sorry. 
Jung, yeah, yeah, no worries, Liz, no problem. So, um, ah, here we have Pablo Escobar, who was like the guy in Colombia, right? The big coke lord of Colombia. And he was the one, last time I said it was El Chavo, it was not El Chavo. It was Pablo Escobar, who is the benevolent cocaine lord, who also simultaneously paid people to kill a lot of people, like hundreds, possibly thousands of people. But this guy was worth $3 billion net worth. And this was like in the 80s. You know, this was not $3 billion now. This is $3 billion then. Um, this was a very bribery based operation. It was all about loyalty, all about establishing, I can't stress this concept of turf enough. And this is something that we'll see when we go to the Mexican cartels for which turf wars are like really, really substantial in terms of how cartels have split and moved apart. Now, at the same time, we had another leader of um, the Medellin cartel, which I just did not pronounce correctly, um, which is Griselda Blanco, the grandmother, or sorry, the god, the grandmother of cocaine, the godmother of cocaine. Um, and she was predominantly located in, in New York City in Florida. And some of you might be familiar with the concept of the cocaine cowboys in the 80s, but this was basically like Miami shootouts in broad daylights, motorcycles driving by and murdering people. Um, this was a very ruthless um, cartel kingpin. Now, if I remember correctly, she was known as the White Widow because she killed multiple of her husbands, but I don't remember 100% if that's the case. If someone wants to fact check that for me as my little tidbit, then that would be awesome. But she was a very violent head of this cartel. Now going to Mexican cartels, there are a, quite a few of them, Los Ceros, the Gulf Cartel, the Sinaloa Cartel, and the Sinaloa Cartel is undoubtedly the most powerful out of the three of those. But the problem was that there used to be only a, a little smattering of big cartels. And now over time, they've broken up into a lot of smaller cartels. And this is actually quite a lot worse for civilians because it means that even though it's not necessarily as much of one massive crime fighting machine, that we're, we're seeing an increase of, of civilians caught in the crossfire because it's more piecemeal, like you're trying to slowly expand out. It's like a game of Catan. So this is a real product of us going in and trying to get the kingpins of these major cartels is that the result of that is that the cartels split up. They become smaller. The leadership is delegated. People can choose their bits. And this has an unexpected kind of paradoxical effect of making the situation worse in many ways. And this is exemplified by how earlier last time I'd mentioned that in 2007, you see the rate of homicides in Mexico just go through the roof. And the reason for that, like I said, was that previously the Mexican military had not been involved until the US was basically like, we'll give you aid and we'll give you a lot of materials. We'll give you like weaponry and, and artillery materials if you step in, if your military steps in. And Mexico was like, okay because the problem was bad. And then the problem got worse, because of course, when you add more big guns to a fight of big guns, then more people get shot. So that's been continuing. And the Mexican government is currently really struggling with um, bribery, really struggling with corruption in the Me Mexican government. Um, in a minute, we're going to watch a clip from Cartel Land. Some of you might have seen Cartel Land. It is undoubtedly one of my favorite documentaries ever. It's on Hulu. Um, I really highly recommend it. It is extremely upsetting, but very well worth knowing what's going on. If you live in the United States, you have an obligation to understand what's happening with our neighbors, especially because we started it and we have to finish it in terms of not continuing to do what we've been doing. Um, JNG really big in Mexico these days as well. Pretty sure a couple cartels form the United Cartels to fortify JNG. Yeah, I, I need to brush up on my cartel knowledge. I warned that there would be graphic imagery. A major part of how cartels um, function is with displays of brutality, displays of violence. Um, this is marking territory. And the reason for this is that you can not just order a hit, you can order a violent hit on the opposition. You can really make it clear what you are willing to do. Um, again, a lot of the situations that have arisen from cartels have been in response to poverty, right? Like this is the major driving factor behind the development of cartels is poverty. And the major driving factor between around, sorry, people joining cartels is to have opportunity. So let's take a look at cartel land. 
The following is intended only for mature audiences. Yeah, Your discretion seriously. advised. Porque no es la única. Toda la vida él ha tenido mujeres. Él es, mm. es su problema de él, las mujeres. Teníamos que salirnos Wait y teníamos second. que dejar esa casa. This is the wrong part of this. El único poder que él debió de haber cuidado era el de Dios y el de la familia. Y no lo tuvo. I think I might have linked the wrong time for this video. Oops. Well, that's bad. But um, Cartel Land is remarkable. I think maybe it's over here, actually. Bear with me. Víctor Rivera Cortés, Alicia Torres Marín, su hijo Evaristo, hija de mi hermano Diana Lisbeth Jaimes Rivera, ella contaba con 18 años, su esposo se llama Belino, su bebé de Jorge Luis. Jorjito. María de Jesús, seis años. Felipe Cázares Marí, es tío de, de Alicia, de 60 años. El bebé de, de tres meses es Cruz, Cruz Rivera Loya. Eran 15, 15 personas en total. 13 cuerpos de una sola familia y dos que llegaron a trabajar a la limonera. Todas las víctimas cortar limón, a, a, este, a irse a las parcelas a, a vivir. Después sabíamos que el patrón tenía que pagar un dinero a los caberos templarios y creo que no lo pagó y se vengaron con ellos, de quien le trabajaba. Que eran inocentes, jóvenes, niños, a los bebés chiquitos, los agarraba de sus piecitos y les pegaban a una piedra. Los aventaron al pozo. So for those of you that missed the dialogue there, it is not uncommon, like I said, for cartels to express their dominance through extreme brutality, extraordinary force. In this particular case, this was a community of people who lived and worked on a lime farm and their employer was owed money to a cartel, the Knights Templar cartel, and couldn't pay it. So the cartel returned and slaughtered his workers as well as their families and teenagers and children and babies in extremely brutal ways. This obviously like there, there are no words that I could do justice to this situation and to this happening. But I think that it's important to remember that the entire situation that has been created here 
is a direct product of the war on drugs, a direct product. The cartels would not exist for drugs. You know, there's always going to be an underground market for something, but drugs are the most lucrative, the most easily accessible, and the easiest to pop up and move elsewhere. Now, the Sinaloa cartel is the most powerful cartel, at least it was last time I checked. Um, cartels are recruiting through Instagram. Wow, cartel TikTok. Wow, that doesn't surprise me. Again, it, it, it presents an opportunity to rise through the ranks to rise out of poverty and into better situations. There are a lot of promises made and a lot of security made. Honestly, a major part of it is that for many people, if you don't join a cartel, then you don't have anyone who is protecting you and you are very much at risk of being harmed by other cartels. Uh, El Chapo was the head of the Sinaloa cartel. Uh, he was actually named public enemy number one in Chicago, despite having never been there before. And the Sinaloa cartel was known for digging their massive tunnels underneath the US-Mexico border, which um, recently were discovered a couple of years ago at least. So uh, generally the Sinaloa cartel is a major importer of heroin, cocaine, MDMA, and fentanyl. Fentanyl is becoming bigger and bigger, but again, there are warring factions within the Sinaloa cartel that lead to further violence. So here's El Chapo. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. El Chapo is possibly the world's biggest drug lord since this guy. He's been arrested three times and has escaped prison twice. The second time was in 2015, when he escaped through this tunnel under his shower in Mexico's top security prison. He was finally recaptured in 2016. But apart from prison breaks, El Chapo is known for being a billionaire drug trafficker. From 2009 to 2011, he was ranked by Forbes as one of the most powerful people in the world. And according to his statement in 2016, he was supplying more heroin, meth, cocaine and marijuana than anybody else in the world. El Chapo was born into a low-income family in Mexico and entered the drug trade as a teenager. He started the Sinaloa cartel in 1989, which eventually became a global drug trafficking organization. Dramatic music. Now, moving across the pond, we've mentioned these things before briefly, but in terms of drug smuggling routes, they're very important. We have two primary regions of opium production. And remember, opium is really the basis for all opiates and opioids. Without opium, or not opi opioids, sorry, opioids can be synthetically engineered. But for opiates, for opium-based substances like morphine, for instance, which again, many countries have a shortage of because the wealthier countries in the world hog morphine and vaccines. <laughs> Who said that? I didn't say that. We have the Golden Crescent, which is in the Middle East, uh, predominantly consists of Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And then you have the Golden Triangle, which is Burma, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. So these two regions are just rife with these charged border tensions for drug smuggling. And obviously in the Middle East, it's significantly more charged for political and social reasons as well. Um, but there's actually a, a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that US Army soldiers are often responsible for participating in smuggling opium. There is a lot of money to be had in this trade and it's far less risky for a US soldier to move through different regions because the US has stuck its greedy little pits into everything than for a local. Oh, oh, thank you. A gift from Zoom. We've removed the 40 minute time limit on your group meeting. That's nice and completely bizarre. So here we see, this is through 2010, but it's not that different. We have the so-called addiction rate, right? This is a, a very loose graph. This is a general representation that generally speaking, the number of people that have substance use disorders between the 70s and the 10s has remained relatively steady. 
Um, what those did, and there's a lot to be said about the fact that it's remained steady. It could have to do with underreporting earlier, underreporting now, differences in how we define these things, differences in the flow of substances. There are a lot of reasons for it, but the point is that our spending to control substances, despite the fact that there isn't very much empirical evidence that supports a need to do so, has gone absolutely bananas. We've spent trillions of dollars at this point on controlling drugs and controlling the drug trade, despite like having no empirical evidence that drugs are actually causing significant distress. Oh, please meet yourself. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get you. Oh, you darn! You got it before I could get there. So this is a massive amount of money, right? We have had a proposed budget of fifteen billion dollars <laughs> in 2011 right like that was a decade ago at this point 15 billion dollars at that point 16 let's round up 16 um and at the first year we did this it, it was a hundred million dollars for this budget so we have just exponentially increased the amount of money that we've been throwing at this thing since the very beginning now, just to go back a little bit, to give some backstory to the war on drugs and how exactly the war on drugs ramped up, we've, we've covered these topics in bits and pieces, but I want to put them chronologically real quick. So this isn't technically the very, very beginning. The very, very beginning was when the Spaniards arrived and they were like, fuck your coca, but actually it's kind of tight. So we're going to punish you greatly for using all these drugs, and then we're going to put it in our wine and in our soda and have a really good time and not give any reparations because we're Spaniards and we're dicks. So after that, centuries of history, peyote, we'll talk a little bit at, at soon about how peyote was um, interfaced with by colonizers, about how peyote was the devil drug that made native peoples go crazy and um, induced fits of madness and how it was just like immediately desecrated until it was extracted into crystalline form by I think a German chemist and when mescaline was in crystal form the western medical world was like wow this is incredible but eating the cactus totally unacceptable so that's another example of like that intermediate point but in terms of like when this really started becoming a more concrete like the ball is rolling um we have titles like this, which I will not read, that indicate, as I said prior, that Black laborers, Black people would go crazy and rape your wives was like the main claim that was made um, after they intentionally, uh, white business owners had intentionally been supplying cocaine to increase productivity and then were like, oh, this is too effective. Um, and of course, there was an immediate media backlash of being like, this is bad, we can't have this, there would be organizing, whatever. How is that even possible? I, I swear to you guys, every single time, how is it possible? So this immediately riled people up and got people really anti-cocaine, even though it was still in Coca-Cola, I think until 1929 or something like that. Um, and then we move into the Bolstead Act, 1918. I wasn't sure last time, I'm not sure this time either. I think it's 1918. That moves us into this prohibition era of Richard Anslinger, who's the world's biggest shit bag, who decides that he wants to start demonizing alcohol um, and previously had called cannabis a safe substance. And then as soon as Mexican immigrants came in, legal Mexican immigrants, he started calling it marijuana and emphasizing that and then really pushing the point that it was brought in by brown people. Um, and then as soon as prohibition was overthrown, he pushed forward and the DEA was created and he was like, man, this weed stuff is really bad, right? It was a smooth transition. And then from there, we have the world wars happening and drug use is kind of at a steady state during that time with different things being added in and out, but it's not the main focus. We have kind of our like social ostracizing measures, alcohol good, cocaine and weed bad is basically how it was. And then we move into the 50s and we start to see the beatniks and the counterculture movements on the East Coast and the West Coast and holy shit, how, 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 how? I quit all of my apps. I give them money. I give them a shelter. They just don't appreciate me. So 
we see the beatniks that start to use amphetamines and they get into the idea of mescaline with Aldous Huxley and then the magic mushroom article comes out from Gordon Wasson and all the beatniks and the counterculture kids are interested in that and then LSD hits the streets in the 60s and counterculture on the west coast meets counterculture on the east coast they slam together in the middle across the pond the mods and the rockers are doing amphetamines and barbiturates and listening to jazz and they're like turn it up so it gets faster and faster and then from there, we have Nixon. Enter, finally, the moment we've all been waiting for is we're going to talk about Nixon, finally. So we have the war on drugs. Just a quick overview. Public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. Drugs are menacing our society. quick cheesy overview of this. So we have the war on drugs beginning uh, late 60s, Vietnam War, soldiers are coming back addicted to heroin. Um, but interestingly, most of the people that came back with um, heroin problems ended up not really having that much of an issue with it once they returned to a system where they had social support and protection and economic stability, etc. So this was definitely the start of something major. I don't even know if, if Nixon fully understood how major it was, but this was the platform that was going to win him elections. This was like the major push that started getting presidential races so invested and involved in the practice of saying that they had a tough on crime stance was that Nixon set this precedent of being like, I, I'm tough on crime. I'm going to protect us. I'm going to protect our streets. Like, this is what I'm doing. Reagan comes in after that and is like, I have to uphold this standard. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger every single year, because how are you going to backpedal on that and be like, I think we should be looser on crime. It's the same reason that I think that incremental legalization doesn't really work, because if you start legalizing only medicine, medicine, plant medicine, whatever you want to call it, like um, weed and uh and acid and mushrooms and classical psychedelics like that, then how are you gonna come back and be like, okay, now it's time to decriminalize heroin and PCP and meth. So it, it really is a very sticky topic. Um, now let's just hear from the man himself about why did Nixon decide that he wanted to go all balls to the wall on criminalizing drugs? What exactly was his incentive here? Let's I think I out. shared the story with you sometime. And now quoting John Ehrlichman, this was Richard Nixon's right-hand man. Quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what, you, what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or to be black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then heavily criminalizing both, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. That's a direct quote from Nixon's right-hand man who had already been incarcerated at this point. There was no incentive for him to throw Nixon further under the bus. Now, here we have Miss E.T. Many of you may be thinking, well, drugs don't concern me, but it does concern you. It concerns us all because of the way it tears at our lives and because it's aimed at destroying the brightness and life of the sons and daughters of the United States. 
For five years, I've been traveling across the country, learning and listening. And one of the most hopeful signs I've seen is the building of an essential new awareness of how terrible and threatening drug abuse is to our society. This was one of the main purposes when I started. So of course it makes me happy that that's been accomplished. ET. So this led to the development that changed everything. Richard Nixon started the war on drugs, but the person who really put the nail in the coffin was Ronald Reagan. 1984 rolls around and Ronald Reagan decides to start privatizing prisons and incarceration rates for drug use goes through the roof goes up to a completely unprecedented level. Our prison population skyrocketed. We're gonna talk about the 13th amendment, either next time or the time after that, I think, when we go into affected communities and stuff like menthol and marketing and low-income black communities and stuff like that. Um, but this was just like a snowball situation and it wasn't just about drugs in general. This time period, previously it was heroin and morphine was like the early seventies was the big scare that was used to criminalize and weed and psychedelics, whatever. But now we have crack entering the picture. We've had white Americans using cocaine in clubs or like club going Americans, more affluent Americans, generally white, using cocaine in clubs and in party settings to such a glamorized and publicized degree that there are magazine ads for ivory snorting tools and chopping razors and straws and mirrors that are specifically targeted for buy this for your cocaine use. And that was in magazines in, through the 80s. And it wasn't until people started catching on to the fact, it was a while before people really were like, oh, people are like dying from cocaine because it is possible, like feasibly possible. Some people do have very rarely a reaction to cocaine where their heart just stops. Like that has happened, it does happen sometimes. Um, it is one of the few, as, a, as stimulants go, cocaine is definitely, I would say, maybe the riskiest one to do in large quantities, which is not what people would expect, right? People would expect meth to be the riskiest one. But cocaine has a pretty significant risk factor for heart, for your heart, I should say, um, which is something that we don't really talk about as much because cocaine is a glamorous drug. You know, what isn't glamorous to society is smoking meth out of a pipe. What is glamorous is chopping up a line and snorting it, even if your nose bleeds afterwards. That has been fetishized. It has become a wealth status symbol. It has become a symbol of the communities that you are a part of. It has become just this extremely sexy thing. Um, but the fact of the matter is that like in many ways, cocaine is far more dangerous than meth in many ways. But that's the thing is it really depends on how you do it. So here we are in the 80s and people are freaking out about coke finally because they were like, ah, oh, people are actually dying from doing this sometimes. We didn't know that was possible. And in comes crack and overnight everything changes. I think that's, is that next? Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. But this is, again, this is definitely not the first time that, or the last time that we're gonna talk about racial incarcerations disparities. We're going to have a full lecture on that very soon. Um, but this was really where things started to get out of control was the Reagan administration. And it started with crack fever. So again, the difference between crack cocaine and powder cocaine is what? Shout it out, put it in the chat. Baking soda. Baking soda. That's exactly right. Baking soda. That's it. You mix in some crack, some cocaine with some baking soda, you heat it, it forms a rock. It's called crack because it makes that snap crackle pop sound when you smoke it. And it is, it is cocaine. It is smokable cocaine because cocaine's uh, melting point is not very conducive to smoking it on plant matter or like smoking it as itself. It's a means of ingesting it. We have criminalized a means of ingesting it. Now, don't forget that cocaine is schedule two and crack is schedule one. Like it, it is criminalizing more heavily the way that you ingest it and stigmatizing to no end the people that ingest it in that manner. So crack became more prevalent in black and brown communities. The reason, probably because America's racist and black and brown communities typically have a lower socioeconomic status because America's racist. And there are many, many generations of history working against people of color in America in ways that white people don't have to deal with. Um, I know I mentioned this at one other point, but this would be a good time to mention the whole deal about privilege. The fact that basically the nature of privilege is you can have 
traumas, problems, socioeconomic disparities, issues with your job, issues with accessibility. You can have all of those things. And if you're white, you will probably have an easier time dealing with them than if you're not. That's privilege. It doesn't mean that what you're dealing with doesn't exist or isn't real or isn't difficult or isn't valid, but you have to accept the fact and acknowledge the fact that if you weren't white, it would be harder. That's what the basis of privilege is. It's not what you do have, or no, it's not what you do have to worry about. It's what you don't have to worry about. That's privilege. So this is the time period, right, where it would make sense, where if you are trying to get access to cocaine and it's expensive as fuck, then you would probably make it smokable. There are a lot of theories floating out around here, like the Dark Alliance about how the CIA dropped cocaine and crack or dropped crack intentionally in low income black neighborhoods. These claims are unsubstantiated. I would love to say that I have answers for them, but unfortunately there just isn't any digging that like fully supports the notion that that happened that I'm aware of. And I've done a good bit of shoveling on this one. Um, there's a lot of bunking and debunking going on, and it's really difficult to know what is what. Would I say it's unlikely that there was government influence in the fact that crack cocaine suddenly started appearing in Black neighborhoods? No, I would say that it's quite likely <laughs> and say that it's perfectly possible, very feasible, very realistic, knowing what we've unearthed ex post facto about what the government has been doing. Now, here's the real scandal here is that this was when minimum sentencing requirements, mandatory minimums were instantiated. This meant that if you were caught with 500 grams of cocaine to sell, you would be punished in the same way as someone caught with five grams of crack to use. That's a 100 to one sentencing disparity, 100 to one. Now, there are some estimates that approximately 10 to 20% of people that used cocaine, including crack cocaine, were Black, and yet they were 13 times more likely to be arrested for this. But the thing is, these mandatory minimums make it so that if you're caught with 500 to 1 or 100 to 1 ratio of powder cocaine to crack cocaine, you get a minimum of five years in prison. Now, to give you an idea, if you have a plastic baggie about this big and it's like full about that much of powder, that's five grams. That's how much five grams is. It's not very much, it's one baggie. Like you could easily have that as a personal supply for like, I don't know, it depends on how much you're doing, but at least a couple of weeks probably, maybe a little less than that if you're doing a lot. Um, let me see. Uh, smoke from crack doesn't smell as bad as from powdered Coke. That's interesting. Um, That joke about crackheads versus cokeheads is super not okay and thoroughly inappropriate. It's, it's not a joke. I know, but I was talking to somebody and they were just saying like, no, they've seen people smoke crack and there seems to be like very like different reactions between gotcha. the two. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. So um, first I want to point out that the word crackhead was developed as a racial slur. Um, we're going to go over that in a second. A lot of people don't know that, but it's important to like factor that in after you do. So the, the real thing that we're looking at here with all stimulants, because there's so much stigma about people getting like itchy, scratchy, twitchy on stimulants, is that the root of administration that you use for any substance is going to directly influence how potent that substance is and the kinds of effects that you can have from it. So smoking crack is a very different experience in terms of a high than snorting cocaine. And the reason is that when you smoke something, it usually will hit your brain quite a lot faster than when you snort it. Like snorting is pretty fast too, but it usually like to feel Coke, it takes like five minutes or so for it to really come on. Maybe like, a, like three minutes if you're lucky. Um, but when you smoke something, usually the effects are felt within seconds. With weed, it can take a little longer. It's kind of a different mechanism. But um, with things like meth and crack, smoking meth, is so different than eating it. Like if any of y'all out there have taken untested pressies before, there's probably a pretty good chance that you've done meth without realizing it. Like meth is one of the most common pressy cuts. A lot of people will test them afterwards and be like, whoa, that was sick Molly. And they'll be like, oh shit, it was caffeine and meth. So that's a big factor here is that 
the more intense and short-lived the high, the higher the likelihood is of having a rewarding and reinforcing pattern with it where you become psychologically dependent or addicted to it. I use the word addicted lightly because it's so charged. Um, but remember, something is rewarding, it feels good, and reinforcing, you want to do it again. That's the basis for what we know is addiction. So I say it's rewarding and reinforcing. So something like MDMA, for instance, is rewarding, but not really reinforcing necessarily because you can't get that much out of it if you keep doing it. Like you are out of serotonin, it's over. So the addictive potential of MDMA is, uh, I would say somewhat lower because you can't really use it that much. You can be preoccupied with it. You can be addicted to pretty much anything, but that's an issue of circuitry. So yeah, I would say that like the, the high from crack is probably going to be a lot fiendier than smoking it, but it's not because it's a different drug. It's because of smoking it. That's the issue. It's a higher concentration hitting you at once, which makes it more prevalent. Um, crack deserves to have a harsher penalty because of the more intense rush you get and it makes it more addictive. Okay, then we might as well, uh, let me think, we might as well make it, what can we do? We should make it more illegal to inject ketamine than to snort it. That's the equivalent. It's like, okay. Or meth, easier example. We should make it more illegal for meth to be snorted than to be eaten. Like, how the fuck are you going to enforce that? That's terrible. It's le legitimately impossible. And it also does not really account for the fact that even with something like heroin, you know, like people that are casual recreational users of heroin usually would not be injecting it, but you can snort it. And like, it it's all about personal preference and autonomy and how you want to do the substance. You know, like injecting ketamine for many people is a much more effective and more comfortable and safer way of doing it than snorting it because snorting ketamine fucking hurts, guys. It's not very, it, it depends, but a lot of the time it hurts. Like you end up not being able to do that after a while. It's big old inflammatory blockages in there and not even a neti pot can free you. And sometimes you're sitting up in bed in the middle of the night being like, I can't breathe through my nose, having nightmares about suffocating. So it's like, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? Like, it's a root of administration. We're not criminalizing a drug. We are criminalizing how you do the drug. It's just not possible. Um, yeah, criminalizing substances doesn't stop anyone from doing jack shit. Uh, oh, be careful about smoking 2-FMA. Mix of MDMA and meth. Yeah, so like it, it, this, the thing is, honestly, this is a major part of criminalization is criminalizing the root. Now, sorry, back to, oh my God, I'm going to run out of time. Are you serious? <laughs> Remember when I was like, we'll go under, maybe we'll go over. This is what happens. So the word crack whore, and it became affiliated predominantly with black mothers, crack whore, um, as well as crackhead, predominantly with black people. Please. If these words are in your vocabulary, swap them out. It's not a very difficult change to make. So here we are. We've just gone through a little bit of the history of the drug war. I've been preaching about this since fucking January. Did it work? Did the drug war work? And the answer is unequivocally no. There's no success in what has happened. Drug use has gone up. Drug prices have gone down. Drug purity has even increased in some areas. The accessibility of substances is higher than it has ever been before. We are pushing back so hard on this thing that it is just like, we, we push on it and it just like spurts out in other directions and crops up there. And then we're just spread out and spending all of this money. And there's a reason for it. It's working as intended. This is a very large corporate exercise, to be honest. And we'll talk about this, I think next lecture, maybe the lecture after that when we talk about incarceration and affected communities. But the spoiler is basically that every single aspect of incarceration is profitable. All of it. It's extremely profitable. To dissolve the prison industrial complex as it stands right now would be hugely detrimental to the economy because we've set it up so that we profit off of prison labor. We've set it up so that incarceration is profitable for the companies that are involved in it, including those that make the ankle monitors, that make the check-in things, that make the jumpsuits. Like, there are so many companies involved in keeping the prison industrial complex alive that we have built 
that it's like how are we going to dismantle that that's kind of like the big concern right now since 1975, no less than 82% of nationally surveyed high schoolers have said that weed was easy to find. It has always been easy to find weed. There was a letter released by over 500 economists saying that supply and demand rules, inherently a basic principle of economics, demands that this can't work. There is no monetary feasible way for the drug war to actually work. And this isn't even taking into account all the social harms that have been done here. Basically, we're looking at a perpetual cycle. And I'm gonna go probably two minutes over to talk about this perpetual cycle because it's really important. We start with a demographic of people who are inherently disadvantaged in one way, shape or form due to race, sexual orientation, gender. We start with a group of people who is because of their inherent disadvantages, more prone to being brutalized by our systems, basically. More prone to mental health concerns, more prone to physical health concerns, to um, profiling, to having difficulty finding a job, to social ostracization, all of these things, to difficulty with education, with opportunity. There are so many things that can be just a setback, a setback, a setback, a setback. And obviously those same groups are also going to be a target. Now, what we end up with is a cyclical pattern of poverty, incarceration, difficulty finding a job after incarceration, and then coping, or doing what is necessary to survive, to provide shelter, basic necessities. This is what we end up seeing that ends up happening, especially because your voting rights are stripped, you're unable to get your driver's license back, and this creates a permanent underclass of people. This creates generational trauma of people who are incarcerated and who cannot get out of that hole. And that can lead to mental health problems and physical health problems that can cause genetic changes for your children, a lack of inheritance for your kids, an inability to set your child up to break a generational pattern, or your child who will probably incur some kind of physical or mental health conditions as a result of having to push through a prior or multiple prior generations of being fucked. This is a cyclical issue. This is a permanent underdog class of blue collar workers who are forced into positions because there's no one else that will hire them, who have criminal records, who have severe trauma from incarceration, and often whose only crime is using a substance like weed. That's what we have. This is a great video. I'm already over though, so I'm not going to, maybe I'll, I'll start off for next time though. I'm gonna stick around for a couple of minutes because there's probably a lot to say about that one, but thanks for tuning in and I will see you guys on Tuesday.